So um, my name is Rick Balfour and I'm with Landcare Trust as the Waikato Catchments Coordinator. And um, I have been in the role for a year now working out of Thames and really enjoying getting to know the northern part of the Waikato and some of the other parts, uh, helping landowners and catchment groups and um, some iwi do land use management assessments and work through catchment management plans and on-farm farm environment plans. And so this webinar is oriented towards uh, the smaller farm and lifestyle block category and folks like yourselves. And uh, Landcare Trust um, has a, a national webinar program going. And so this is one of the opportunities to learn a little bit about farm environment plans as opposed to um, other more general topics. So what I wanted to do was um, use that chat button or chat mode as a way to interact. And um, let's get into the presentation. So the first thing we wanted to do is figure out why we're here. And that's pretty straightforward. Um, one of the major changes and things going on out in the farming environment is uh, new regulations around fresh water and climate and biodiversity requirements. And while some of those regulations don't apply to lifestyle blocks and runoffs less than 20 hectares, um, and you're not required to have these by law, um, it is a good idea. And a lot of folks are getting behind the farm environment um, tool because it's so uh, helpful to get things uh, lined up and identified in your farm. So there's, some, there's a range of benefits. Um, it's pretty much seen as a useful tool. Uh, helps farmers look at their uh, farms and their blocks with a, a different set of eyes than they may be used to. And it's really looking at the natural values and figuring out what's going on on the farm with biodiversity and fresh water that you can identify. And then looking at your land use and your, and your practices and your stocking and other things going on. If you've got stock, um, it applies to horticulture as well. And having a look at what uh, is happening on the ground and then it sort of has a practical result. It helps you assess your property and create the farm environment plan. And has a rational aim, which is to understand your natural resources and how your farming systems uh, are interacting with them. And then there's a chance to set out a plan to manage the risks that you've worked through and figured out uh, once you've done the assessment of your farm itself. So there's some really good reasons that folks are using the farm environment tool on their farm, regardless of the size of the, the farm itself. So this is a um, workshop in the form of a webinar, and um, we just want to help you through some of the steps to critically assess your property. And um, we've got a template, I hope you already have that open next to you, because you can refer to that as we follow along. I'll have some pieces of the template that I'll be referring to in the presentation. And um, once you've had a crack at it, then there's a good opportunity to get to um, some follow-up advice, um, either through one of the Landcare Trust folks or through one of the farm advisors out in the industry. There's lots of help out there for you. So um, feel free to look at your farm environment template as you go along, and um, we'll carry on to the next slide. So uh, as I mentioned before, industry is getting behind the whole farm environment plan uh, mode. And um, there's Hort New Zealand, there's Dairy NZ, and there's Beef and Lamb New Zealand as uh, some of the big ones that are really getting wraparound support available to farmers and, and landowners, including having extension agents available, putting on workshops on the uh, nuts and bolts of farm environment plan development, and then checking up and helping uh, farmers do the implementation side because it's um, it's a living document and uh, it's something to work to and adjust and update and um, it's all about ecosystem health so understanding the impact of your land use on the ecosystem which includes soil fresh water biodiversity and regardless of how we use the land we have an impact so completing a farm environment plan process helps us consider what we can tweak for an overall better outcome. So one thing um, that's, you know, with a bit of understanding of what the farm environment plans are about, um, it's, as I said, a living document. So it's one of those things that you start off with, um, you know, and including the whole family, but um, 
what do you already know and do and do well on the farm itself? So it's a chance to take stock, um, and wander around or think about how you've been doing your farm or managing your lifestyle block over the years and um, take a look and assess what practices uh, could be improved on and how you might go about that. So the first thing to start off, and this is the it's part of your template on your um, farm environment plan document that I sent out, is to just do the simple, you know, details about the property, the description, the assets, and a bit of relevant history. And, and it may be that it's converted from one type of land use to another in years past, or you're on a pathway to certification for organic um, certification. Uh, certification. So include that sort of stuff. Certainly it's a good idea to um, take lots of photos because that before and after um, story is a really good way to track the progress and any changes you might have made. And then the, the next most important part after that is the map itself, which is an essential part of any of our farm environment plans. And um, just to reassure you, if you're not a GIS whiz, uh, you can be as simple as uh, hand drawing on an um, aerial map or using um, Google Maps, which is pretty straightforward. And we've put together a, a webinar on our website, which I'll show you later, that um, tells you um, how you can use a simple tool like Google, Google Maps um, to get this job done. And some of the things that you want to put on the uh, farm environment uh, plan map are just your typical uh, areas of native vegetation, uh, restoration potential, wet areas, stock crossings, laneways, areas prone to erosion, standoff pads, so all those sort of bits in the farm that um, you can actually put on the map and consider them as in independent sites to investigate. So it'll be important, particularly when we get to the critical source areas, um, putting those on the map so you can really pin them down as um, related to an action plan that um, you can come across. So uh, and it can apply to a smaller block as well, um, where it's more about the, the, what spaces and structures and um, designated zones you have on your farm or your lifestyle block to manage. And so it doesn't really matter about the skill, the, the point is, is getting that information down on the map so you can start working with it. So from there, you've got some goals to think about. And um, those uh, goals can be added as you develop your farm environment plan. And then they can be revisited after you've done your assessment of your land use and environmental risks and things like that. So um, a typical goal might be, you know, planting natives along the stream, um, replacing culverts in the top paddock for fish passage, um, reduce sediment, and as you can see from the set of four examples there that each of them are fairly straightforward and they have a time um, estimate about when you'd like to do these actions by. And that's, that's super helpful to have a time bound um, goal or objective to keep you on track. That's not to say it's set in stone. So um, one of the things you could remember is that um, the outcome base, so you really want a solid thing that you can see when it's done, you can tick it off, and it could be as simple as saying increasing the amount of eels in the stream or looking after the stream habitat. But as general as that is, it needs to be broken down. So it might have a range of um, different actions that go with that. The other thing to think about is um, talking to your neighbors and see if you've got some similar goals that might be of interest to them and uh, figure out if there's some things you can team up on and a lot of um, work's been going on around uh, catchment management plans developed by catchment groups, which are simply a group of farmers and landowners who've gotten together and uh, started to coordinate uh, some of those big picture things. Uh, stream health, for example. Obviously, streams run through all sorts of properties. So you can uh, focus on what you can do as a catchment group or as a group of farmers, not necessarily in a formal group but you can team up and make things more efficient and go after funding as well. So it's about recognizing what's good and sometimes assessing what you see is not so good. And um, as you go through that process on your land management plan template, you can list your the different types of land uses and practices you're um, dealing with. 
And then you can look on there and say, is that appropriate or um, uh, attributed to the land use that I'm doing on my farm? And if so, you can you know, take it off and say, yes, it is, or no, it isn't, or maybe it's not applicable at all. You don't have stock on your lifestyle block. Um, but there could be some unknowns. And you can see there under fertilizer and nitrogen use um, that um, you've got an unknown there. And maybe that's because you simply haven't had any measurements of, of stream nutrient levels. So that'll be an action plan in itself to go and um, get some help um, with uh, a local uh, an ecologist or uh, catchment group expert from another catchment or a land care trust staff person like myself who can come in and help you get that kind of testing done to get that one ticked off. So the next series of slides um, will run through some of the land management practices on your template. And um, we'll look at some of those things that we've talked about, critical source areas, examine those a little bit, and we'll work our way through um, a range of them so you can see what we're talking about that farm environment plan would tackle. So um, within the realm of uh, ecosystem health, the the key thing that a lot of these um, efforts are focused on is maintaining waterway health. And that's the identification and subsequent mitigation of critical source areas um, that you work through on your farm environment plan. And these are sites that are prone to surface runoff. Um, they can carry nutrients, um, bacteria such as E. coli or sediment into the waterways. And that's probably if there's one area that needs the most attention or to check to see if it's happening on your farm or lifestyle block. It's that issue of runoff of nutrients, bacteria and sediment into waterways. It could be your own wetland. Uh, it may not be connected to a stream system and a larger catchment. So those are the sorts of things that you really want to take care of. And a good way to start is um, getting those on your maps as a site and also taking your photos of the state of it. Uh, an even better way to do it is to go out um, either with a map or with a camera and look at what you've got on the ground and say, okay, what would be going on here that I should be concerned about? And if you look on the slide uh, image on the left, you'll see a, a yellow zone there that I've identified. And that's um, typically that foot of the hill where anything running down off the hill in a heavy rain event with exposed soil is gonna end up in that swale zone. And if you look, um, in the foreground, you can see there's a race or a laneway that's pretty well sloppy with mud. And that's another thing to check on. What's going on? Where's that mud going, if anywhere? And is that a problem? And on the right-hand side, you can see, um, sorry, you can see a drain there. And that's you know where some of the stuff will in inevitably end up in. Um, whatever drainage system you've got, it could be a creek, it could be a modified creek, or it could be um, a typical drain that's just been placed in there to reduce the water table off the slope. So you can see in that picture there, it's pretty muddy. So it's another example of um, what happens when it, you get heavy rain and, and sediment runoff. And so those are the sorts of things that you want to um, identify. What are the impacts from um, runoff? Uh, they're really numerous ways that um, are affecting our water table or your own uh, farm resources. And it varies across uh, different regions. You've got um, geology and climate and predominant land use that influence at a catchment level. And um, the things that we really focus on related to the environment is sedimentation. And the obvious things that a lot of you will be aware of is that that affects water clarity, increases water temperature, it blocks photosynthesis of the uh, aquatic plants and it damages the gills of fish and invertebrates trying to live in that um, aquatic system. Um, with nitrogen and phosphorus in excess, it can lead to nuisance growth in plants, um, algae and extreme concentrations. It's even toxic to aquatic animals and human health. And in the Waikato, we've had a few outbreaks at the end of summer, which have been a real concern where um, we've even had teams rescuing eels and and other fish out of uh, some of the control um, zones to um, stop them from perishing in the hot sun and lack of oxygen. So it's, a, it's an everyday problem at the end of a long summer. And um, you can think about what's going on on your block to potentially avoid that. 
E. coli is another one in waterways, and it's an indicator of fecal matter. Um, it could be human or animal. It could be a failing septic system on the farm or next door. So uh, getting that into the waterway um, is an indicator of a presence of harmful bacteria. And of course, that could be an issue for your um, downstream valleys, swimming holes, or whatever it is, or taking water for your own use. So um, another way to think about it is uh, how those nutrient losses and topsoil losses affect your bottom line. So um, that's a, you know, always front of mind with any um, farm management situation. So uh, you don't want to be losing that good stuff. Those are your assets. Um, and so when you have that a chance, like um, it's been raining right now, it was so noisy on the roof before, I could hardly hear myself think. So the delay actually helped a little bit. Um, so one of the ways that people do it is they grab the gumboots, grab the camera, um, grab the map, and head out and look at um, those parts of your property where um, normally when you're busy and it's raining, you just want to get the job done and get back home or under shelter. But going out, purposely looking at what's happening uh, in a rain event or just after a rain event is, is a really good idea. And so head out and um, figure out where the water's flowing. Uh, think about it in terms of impacting water quality with sediment, if it's reaching a water body, um, where does the water flow over to and, and is that carrying potential contaminants? And where does the water pool? It might not be flowing into a, a stream system or a drain, it might be pooling and that creates very soft ground, which is a risk for pugging and, and further soil um, exposure. So. Um, the way we then turn around and look at it is, you know, how does that, what you see on the ground, look like as good management practices are described? So we simply talked about them as um, agreed techniques that mitigate impacts from uh, some land management practices and, and land uses. So it's, it's common accepted um, practices to help you get around some of the problems or avoid them or mitigate them, offset them. And so what we're going to do now is run through some of those um, things that uh, good management practices focus on. And that's typically um, stock and winter grazing practices, cultivation, erosion issues, all the way down through um, to the end. And so that's, uh, information that you can refer to in Appendix 1 of your template, uh, we've got a lot of good resources um, linked there in that other document. So um, we're sort of powering through. Uh, quite a bit tonight, so um, don't worry about uh, too much about the detail because we've provided you with a um, resource for that and guidance. So, um, on the stock side of things, um, if you've got stock, you'll be thinking about stock management, production, and animal welfare. And, and this GMP sort of makes you look at okay, beyond those two important things, um, how about the impact on the environment from stock impacts, if any? And then looking at you know your stocking rates, uh, looking at the potential for overstocking to cause some issues with compacted soils or runoff, and potentially um, in the long run turning around and uh, affecting the health of your stock. And so people are finding that it's better to have fewer well-fed stock um, and get better returns than having a lot more underfed or not so healthy stock. So those are the things that really uh, need to be examined. Um, the other thing is looking at uh, stock in relation to any waterways, drains or wetlands. And you're probably aware that there's regulations coming in uh, to encourage or require um, setbacks and stock exclusion, which is mainly through fencing, and um, make sure that um, the stock is um, out of those areas that are really prone to pugging um, early in the winter or even in the summertime when uh, the dry paddocks um, in those grazed um, early enough so that you don't have overgrazing and lose that grass sward. So um, as the old saying says, uh, take the water to the stock, not the stock to the water. So um, that's the kind of thing you'd look at as you walk around your farm. Have you got any issues related to uh, stock, or either the intensity or um, the extent that they're um, getting into places that are causing you problems. The next thing is around winter grazing. It's a topical uh, thing, uh, especially at this time of year. There's a um, special um, focus on it recently with submissions 
closing uh, last month. And um, so uh, it's, a, it's about um, when you're using that technique, uh, adjusting your technique so that um, you're not causing uh, problems. And things like um, planning early enough to acknowledge which paddocks are ideal for it and which are not, um, avoiding the greatest impact, uh, things like strip grazing and having the alignment in the right direction, uh, even when you're putting the crop in in the beginning, running your farrows um, along the slope and not up and down the slope. So a lot of it's pretty straightforward, but um, it could be that uh, things you've been doing or things that you your uh, previous managers or previous owners have been doing have set the farm up um, to have some issues. Uh, one of the things that um, is handy is that beef and lamb, for example, have got some really good uh, webinars around winter grazing that give you some a good steer on on how to do these things, and so that's available there um, for guidance. Cultivation and cropping, so that's important to think about paddock selection, uh, avoiding the steeper paddocks, um, cultivating along the, the contours, and um, and then avoiding the even in, in wind having any sediment or any soil loss that's going to end up happening when the ground is too bare or overworked um, or not enough grass on it. So <clears throat> the main thing to think about is the fact that healthy soils will reduce sedimentation, and that's through building up organic matter, uh, good soil structure, and permeability to reduce the runoff. And one of the webinars I put on um, earlier this year was on um, the introduction of dung beetles to pastures. And that's been a, um, a very interesting technique and is gaining quite a bit of uh, support and application across the country. There's a dung beetle for every stock type, every land use type and every soil type just about. So um, get in touch with me if you're interested in that. And the main thing is also to think about your buffers around um, any waterways, uh, especially with any soil tilling. So on hill slopes, often you get um, steep rilling or gullying. And so the way to avoid some of those problems is to minimize tracks, uh, go make the tracks go across the slope and not with the slope or down the fall line as they call it. And then keeping tracks um, not so steep so that um, the water's not speeding up and scouring out. And then when you can, if, um, put in the cutouts and the culverts and the sediment traps to catch whatever's uh, going to come down. Sometimes you can't avoid a bit of that, but you can set things up to stop that sediment and runoff going into a stream where you don't want it. Another aspect of it is um, consider allowing native re reveg um, or regeneration or planting trees in erosion prone uh, land like gullies, um, retiring it. And, um, it's not as productive and it's a, a long-term problem. So sometimes retiring it and putting it into uh, shelter and, and plants is the best way to go. Uh, stream erosion is a big focus these days. So um, you've got a lot of um, farmers looking at how they can uh, do the stock exclusion and riparian uh, planting projects. There's a huge amount of support around from councils and uh, granting programs and that's where when you've got a uh, catchment group, you can um, band together and, and take on bigger scale projects and get um, some advantage with bulk buying and or a single contractor coming to do multiple farm fencing along a stream that traverses different properties. And so that's a really smart way to go about it. And uh, one of the things um, you can do is uh, you can sometimes use engineering, hard engineering as they call it, which means structures and rock walls and so forth or even bank reshaping um, or using plants uh, to plant up and try to hold the soil better. Anytime you do hard engineering though, and even using a digger to, to um, reshape things, you need to, count, to contact council first because um, those things might require a consent. Uh, plantings along those streams these days, a lot of the plantings are um, focusing on use of natives, uh, natives that are appropriate to the area or to that zone. And, um, and then other folks are using poplars and willows um, to augment that, particularly for opportunities where you can do coppicing or uh, pollarding, where you can use the branches cut off um, and uh, as a stock feed. 
but um, there are certain willows that have been around for a while, like crack willow or pussy willow, that is not suitable because it's more invasive. And so there's there is um, genetic stock that uh, doesn't produce a seed. So that's um, something to think about there. With wetlands and uh, riparian management areas, um, you want to think about where your streams are um, going or where they spill over, where your um, overflow zones are. And when you're thinking about fencing, especially, you don't want to um, set yourself up with some issues. You can see from that image on the side there, um, some of the areas where if the fencer had been told to strictly go to three or five meters, um, there would have been a, quite a, a lot more fencing that wouldn't have been very efficient. So uh, I've worked with a lot of farmers and they end up um, cutting across these lobes of a meandering stream and um, gaining a bit more planting area and, um, and less cost with fencing and, and straighter lines. And um, so that's really important. Also think about where your fences are in terms of um, overflow so that they don't end up trapping a lot of debris and then getting pushed out by the pressure of a flood. Um, or in some cases, farmers will um, use different kind of fencing that has a, a break that can uh, pop off when there is a, a heavy flow and then they can just reach the fence again after the water's gone back down and not lose any fencing material. So uh, in your farm environment and your mapping exercise, you wanna be walking around, looking at your wetlands and thinking about um, those things, but also where there are seeps, boggy areas or springs and gullies, and just putting those uh, photos and put those into your um, maps. And then um, if you're grazing, of course, then you're gonna be um, setting those fences in to keep stock out of those streams. Uh, in particular, and um, some of the recommendations are, you know, if there's a minimum of three meters, it's better to go to five meters on flat land, uh, even 10 meters on slopes. And what I find with farmers is that <clears throat> they are uh, leaving enough room for a grass strip inside the fence, and that allows uh, contractors, pest control guys, uh, volunteers, and uh, even getting your own stock out when they stray in there uh, a whole lot easier and then uh, planting right up to the fence. And so uh, that's something I've been recommending with farmers in their um, planting plans is to allow that. And grass is actually a really good filter. So that's one of the values of keeping a grass ward of rank grass just inside the fence for a couple of meters. You can get a quad up there. Uh, somebody can walk up there. Um, you can set your traps if you're doing predator control in that zone. And um, Otherwise, if you plant right up to the fence, then you're losing that access and you have to go in and out of every paddock um, and to get along your stream corridor. So the main thing is to think about ways you can reduce input of waste into, into the waterways and also minimize stream disturbance. So you might um, want to make sure that if you've got a stream crossing, that you've got a culvert lined up for that spot or a bridge even. Um, sometimes fords are used. But fish passage is an important thing to consider these days as well. So um, let's see, moving through um, some of the reasons that we do those things, that um, kind of planting plan is over time, um, those native plantings will really still help to um, stop the erosion. Um, it'll really help provide shade, which will cool the water and um, the habitat that's created, not just for terrestrial animals, but also for aquatic species is a huge improvement on uh, some of our streams, which are now uh, open to the air stock. There's no, there's no shade, there's no aquatic plants. And um, so it's, it's a really important part of the, all the work that's going on on farms these days. Um, a bit more focused on the biodiversity side of things. So um, some people are lucky enough to have a patch of bush on their properties or a wetland or a swamp and, um, and other people don't have any, but they wanna create those out of the old remnants of those features that they might have on the farm. So um, look at those places, not just where there is things, but also where you could develop them. So because they're a precious resource for, for all sorts of our native birds and insects and um, can really add some um, 
pleasure as well as some uh, property value to your property over overall. But um, as we've said before, the first job is to get the stock out. And um, and and sometimes um, with Manuka and Totara and things that are less palatable, uh, you can get uh, sheep in there if you've got sheep. Um, but in the long run, uh, you'll want to have that um, out of grazing and um, the, the control of weeds going on at the same time. So I don't know if uh, any of you have uh, seen the app called Seek. It's a pretty cool app. It's on your, um, just put it on your cell phone. And when you come across a weed or a plant that you're not sure of, you can use this little app to take a photo of it. And um, over a few iterations, it can narrow down and tell you what plant that is or whether it's a weed. And the council's got lots of uh, good um, resources on that side of identifying weeds and, and what to replace it with. So um, one thing I would encourage, especially small block owners and lifestyle block owners to do is to think about um, the potential for adding biodiversity, even on relatively small uh, acreage or hectares. And that could be even just hedges and using multiple species for hedgerows and, and shelter belts. Um, if you've got wetlands that you're thinking about modifying or improving or, or refurbishing with native plants, there are council rules around um, wetland management or development or redevelopment and enhancement. So always seek advice um, before you get um, too far along uh, altering a wetland because there's, there's even some new rules that are coming along that they're still sorting out. So it's important to get that advice before you get too far into it. Fertilizer use, um, there's a lot of um, uh, good knowledge available through the uh, suppliers of fertilizer with professional expertise around the rates and the best fertilizer um, to use. And there's rules around not putting it too close, you know, uh, say within five meters of waterways and gullies. Um, and then making sure that you've got riparian planting to filter and slow the runoff if you do have any um, on heavy rain events. So uh, one of the best things that we can advise is to um, get your soil tested before you start applying um, unnecessary fertilizer, because what plants can't take um, will just end up in the soil, go into the water table or get um, leached out and, and run into waterways themselves. So that's money down the drain, literally, that you don't want to be paying for if you can help it. And that one of the last um, sort of main areas of uh, critical source areas or problems with uh, runoff and sedimentation is um, the built environment. So uh, that can be among the most critical uh, areas of uh, pollutants and water um, quality affecting sediments and, and runoff. And that's around um, tracks, uh, bridges, culverts, or the lack of them, and um, making sure that um, things like uh, sediment traps are in place, um, that you've got the troughs extended away from the, the water courses because uh, stock will naturally congregate around a trough or a, um, a water point. And, uh, and then making sure that if you do have a stream crossing that you've got that um, set up with a, a decent um, culvert or a bridge uh, or even a ford if you have to. Uh, and another aspect on uh, particularly higher density areas of, of development is when you've got septic systems. So making sure that that uh, septic system is functional and that um, you don't have any problems um, with your soakage field not being maintained or, or fit for purpose. All right, moving along. Um, all we gave you has a, a way to sort of work through the different land use practices on your farm and then figure out what is actually going on with your particular farm and um, whether this particular focus is relevant or not. And sometimes it might be that you're just not sure. So you work through that template and um, you can pick off what you've, you know about, what's not relevant or not happening. And um, as I said before, you've got an opportunity to um, see if you've got a water quality test that you can do to narrow down that information. And once you've got those sort of things relevant, that will help you focus in what you're going to do to um, identify the level of risk involved for these practices that you see happening or impacts that you've figured out at your critical uh, source areas. 
And the way we do that is a simple uh, risk table. You've probably all seen that in your health safety manual. But it's um, basically looking at those things that are going on on your farm and saying, okay, um, how likely is it um, that those things are happening? Is it very likely or is it very unlikely? And then looking at the impact and saying, is that moderate or is it severe or, or is it really not happening? Is it just negligible? And then when you get that intersection of those two things, if you've got something that's very likely and it's negligible, then you, obviously your list, sorry, your risk is really low. And on your list of management practices, you can fill that in on your table and um, then go on to the next thing. You get something up in the top end where it's very likely and the impacts are likely to be um, severe, then you're in that high risk zone. So that's where that table is handy because you can put those different land use actions or actions that you want to do and you can create a, a priority scale based on the level of risk. And um, we know there's a lot going on on a farm or even a lifestyle block. And, and so this is a way to help you figure out what things do you really need to tackle first. And um, that might you know, be adjusted by uh, finances, by the season of the year when you can do certain things like tree planting. And it could also be what your neighbours are doing and what you can go in on, um, say, as a catchment group member or, or just a, a cooperative effort between different neighbours. So. Um, prioritize those actions that you've got and um, and then just work your way through it and as we said before the FEP is a living document uh, nothing that you put in there is set in stone it's a guide it's there to help you work through and then when you ticked off something you can adjust um, what you've actually done compared to what you said you were going to do or you might have to move the dates out to adjust for delays and things that you couldn't um, avoid. So use it as a living document. Don't let it uh, fester and gather dust on the shelf. All right, we're, we're coming down towards the end now. Um, we want to, uh, and I've probably spoken a bit fast, um, given the uh, delay, I was trying to make sure I finished up on time, even though I started late. Sorry. Um, but um, what we really want you to do is take this information, the template, your map and or aerial photo or print out of your farm uh, in hand and head out there um, with your gumboots on and identify those critical source areas because those are typically um, the best things to start with because those are the problems that are causing either your stream or wetland quality problems or, or downstream issues um, for neighbours and beyond. So that's typically where we want you to start. Um, and then look at your goals based on what you're finding you need to do and tweak and uh, giving those goals some priority through your risk assessment and then um, get some help. Um, talk to your neighbours, see what they've done. A lot of folks have already got farm environment plans underway or, or completed. So it's helpful to go and have a chat with your neighbour who might have already got one in hand and see how they did it. And then if you've got uh, questions, you can also check in with uh, Landcare Trust staff or uh, Dairy NZ or um, sheep and beef, you know, the, whoever you can find. Sometimes you have to be a registered or certified uh, member of their co-op to access some of their resources. And other times you can just get it off the web, but the Landcare Trust has got a heap of stuff on our website that's really useful. And um, you've got my email so you can uh, keep an eye on things or keep in touch. I'll send an email out after this and um, you can um, keep in touch and, and let me know how you're getting on or if you need some advice or somebody to talk to, I can connect you um, with them. And then one possibility, depending on um, the response after this, is that we put on an in-person workshop and that's where we can gather together uh, on someone's lifestyle block and um, walk around and, and have a, a good uh, networking and, and discussion session on the ground and look at those things in practice. So um, I'm going to wrap up the um, slide soap portion of this uh, right now and we'll go to stopping that share and um, close that down. What I wanted to show you um, was the, um, let's see, 
other screen I've got, and that is um, Landcare Trust website. So let's go to that. And I hope you can see that all right. So that's Landcare Trust website. You might have already visited it um, through getting registered, but there's a heap of uh, good stuff on there that you can access. And one of the things you might not have seen is um, the catchment maps that we've got. And that's where we've got an interactive map for the public. Um, and then this is zooming in on my um, northern Waikato zone. And so you can see there uh, different catchment groups. So for example, up where my cursor is, is um, I click on that and it gives the um, catchment group associated with that catchment, which is the Western Firth catchment group. And if you want to contact them, um, their email will come to me and I can give you the details of um, who that is. And let's double check, you can see that. Um, and so that's uh, one way to find out what's happening uh, around your area, who your local catchment group might be, or your nearest one, depending on where you are. If you're over in uh, Raglan, then you've got um, the Kafia Harbour, which is a catchment collective. And you can find out more about there. Some of those folks have um, a click through to a, a website. So that's the one that's hosted by Beef and Lamb. They've got some information on the Kafia and Coast River Care um, Group. So that's helpful. And then um, you can um, find out through me or through the contact uh, who you can get in touch with next. So that's pretty much it. Um, I can see I might have been talking to only a few compared to who signed up. Uh, any, are there any questions among the folks that um, are participating? None? Okay, I think we'll just wrap it up then. Um, and we'll bid you a good night and thanks very much for joining.